Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin this study with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful that we can come together this morning. We invite your Holy Spirit's presence as we open your word, as we struggle with some of the issues uh, regarding um, uh, the death of Gideon and uh, ephod we ask lord that we can understand these things correctly we also need to understand what role time has in this movement and um, and its abuses so we just pray that you can help each of us to have a clear and understanding mind and an open heart to be corrected and we ask this in jesus name amen So yesterday we we finished off with a um, a problem an, a problem that I'm having. So maybe not everyone else is is struggling with the same things. But we have time still in our movement, and and I and I've I've taught and I've believed that this time that we have is is typical. That is. We're not looking at time dealing with the second coming of Christ or the Sunday law or any other promise of special significance that we find in God's word. That this time that's been given to this movement is um, addressing internal issues within the movement. And we are not to be setting time for these events that we would have on the big line. The line that Ellen White's talking about. And that's the position I've had ever since we've introduced time setting into this movement. Um, but time still exists. And we have dates that are future. And we know that we can't uh, predict events on these future dates. We just know that they become a witness uh, that God is, is leading us. That's the position that I've taken. Um which I found it odd that in 2000 uh, or in 2020 on December 6, 2020, when um, FFA made their declaration regarding about the symbolic use of numbers, they never really took into account my position. That is, we had dates in the future. They would say, you can't put a date in the future. But the thing is, we didn't put these dates into the future. These dates exist as part of a structure Nobody's trying to set time, at least I'm not. Um, and these dates were given for, by God to this movement. And so they have to basically deny everything that the movement taught. And, and Jeff was really clear about that, that July 18th wasn't just something that came up. It's actually everything that this movement, everything that he had studied led to that date. And we've had all these types of witnesses again and again so what we're what i suggested is when we looked at judges <clears throat> um chapter seven so i'm gonna go there we'll come back to this chart um so the judges here and we were looking at um i guess it's uh was in chapter was it chapter eight yeah, chapter eight, that's not chapter seven, chapter eight. And we, we looked at Gideon's ephod and, and I struggle with this and also with the death of Gideon and Abimelech and all these things that we're going to look at. But with Gideon's ephod, here we have the message of July 18th, which Gideon represents. And we have um, the defeat of the Midianites and Ziba and Zamuna. And then you're going to have um, all of the spoil, and we're going to have Ishmael mentioned there. We're going to have these golden earrings, and they're going to take this spoil, and they're going to make an ephod. And, and I'm saying that there's something about this ephod that represents uh, something in regard to this movement that becomes a stumbling block to the movement. And I'm suggesting that it, it's time setting.
That is, there is a, a way in which time is misused. That, that's my suggestion. And so that this ephod, because it's something that's structured, um, uh, so how would how would we address that? So has anybody thought about it since uh, yesterday? Because <clears throat> this is going to become a snare to this movement, right? To Gideon, which represents July 18th, and to his house, so those in the movement. And, and I know we have to put these on a line as well. So we're going to have to try to understand what this means. Any thoughts? I always see time setting kind of a snare now okay we see it we see it happening right now no. right so so we can put time on a line so if i if i go to this i'm gonna go through this in a bit more detail this this chart that i brought up yesterday i, I, added, know, the, I was thinking of prediction with the presidents right so we have the prediction president. that's a yeah it's definitely a time Event setting, event of event. Okay. But in this situation, isn't the time setting, the the use of the time setting in this way, a crutch? A crutch rather than a snare? Well, it's both. Okay. Um, so explain what you mean by a crutch. Okay. <clears throat> when you're looking at it as a snare, you're looking at it as a pitfall, something that that entraps people. Yeah. When you look at it as a crutch, it's something that people come to rely upon, that when you've used it one time, you may choose to continue to use it even when you don't need it. Okay. Because at this point in this Earth's history, in our history, we are to walk by faith and not by sight. Okay. And when we are choosing to try to set a time, we are not walking by faith. Right. Now, when it comes to, and the point thing here, I think, is choosing. So, for instance, all of these things that we see here that I have on this line are not anything that was chosen. They we, we do need to measure the time, right? We do need to be aware of time. But let, let's take a look at something like April 5th. So I've done studies on April 5th. It's at the end of this chart. Now, the question is, how did I come up with April 5th? Does anybody know why I even looked at April 5th, 2030? Represents the first day of the first month at the, for the end of, I mean, for the week of Christ study. Right. So the way that I, I noticed, and I noticed this a few years ago, uh, I think probably in 2019, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I noticed that 2,300 months um, from October 22nd, 1844 would bring us to April 5th, 2030. But I wasn't looking for anything at April 25th or April 5th, 2030. I wasn't thinking about it. I just knew that we had this date in the future and that it would be based upon 2300 months. But it came from our study dealing with Ezra chapter seven to 10. So when we started looking at Ezra chapter seven to 10, well, even before then, we were, we were looking at... Um, uh, it's when we were studying Abraham, right? So I'm going to bring this up here. So we were studying Abraham. This was the beginning of this understanding the lines. 
early on. And we had looked at the, the chapters that the covenants occurred in. It's going to be in chapter 12, right? That he's going to, is it chapter 12? Let's get this mixed up. Genesis. Yeah, so chapter 12, he's going to be 75 years old. And he's going to be called um, out of Haran, right? He's going to leave and he's going to have the covenant first spoken. This is the first account of the covenant with Abraham. And then there's going to be that confirming of the covenant, right? That's going to happen in chapter 15. And then in chapter, which chapter is it that the covenant occurs again? This is going to be circumcision. Anybody remember? Chapter 17, right? And then finally the offering of Isaac, where the covenant is confirmed again. So we get this number, 67,320. And if we divide this number by 360, we get 187, right? So that's that's where I first started to think about this more seriously. Because when I saw this number, 6,320, I recognized that it was similar to another number, and that number is simply 2,300 times... 29.530587. That is 2300 actual lunar months is three. Um, so that's going to be uh, 600 days more than 187 prophetic years. So the difference there is 600, right? So 67,320. Here we have 67,920 with a little decimal at the end. So I could recognize that this is, uh, if I divided it by um, 360, I would have more than 187. But I could look at that number as 187 prophetic years plus 20 prophetic, prophetic months. So that it's 187 Two zero, right? Does that make sense to people? If I take those 600 days, that's 20 prophetic months. So 2,300 lunar months is 187 prophetic years plus 20 prophetic months, the symbol of 18720. Does that seem like a reasonable observation? Seems to add up. Yeah. Then I also know that 2,300 months is 186 years. That is, if I just do a cardinal count. So if I go from October 22nd, 1844, and I go, well, instead of going from October 22nd, 1844, I'm going to go from April 19th, 1844. That is, I'm going to go from the first day of the first month in 1844. And I'm going to count 186 years. Now, normally, to get to the Day of Atonement, to get to October 22nd, 1844, uh, we would count, and, and I'll do this here, so. Uh, just hang on a second. So normally what we would do, I'll bring up the calendar so you can see this more clearly. So I'm going to go here, 1844. I'm going to go to April 19th. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, oops, I'm just going to put 186 days. So it's a cardinal count. And it's going to bring me to October 22nd, the 10th day of the seventh month in 1844. Now, in the story of Ezra, 
they're going to begin the story of Ezra on the first day of the first month. Right. So we know that. And, and we, we looked at Millerite history and we could see the first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month. These things all show up in 1844 that happened in 457 BC. But the story of Ezra 7 to 10 ends on the first day of the first month. That is, it gives us one complete year. And that means this story of Millerite history should also end on the first day of the first month. Does that make sense to people? Because we end up on October 22nd, 1844. That's the Day of Atonement. But we know the third angel's message carries. And so the idea then is if we're going to have a repeat of Millerite history, because that repeat of Millerite history comes, Millerite history comes from 457 BC, the journeys of Ezra from Babylon to Jerusalem and the events that follow. But they only bring us to October 22nd in Millerite history. But wouldn't it make sense that we, we have to complete that story of Ezra and that it completes on the first day of the first month? Now, we also have 9-11 uh, representing the first day of the first month. And so the argument can just be that's our repeat of history with 9-11, which is symbolically the first day of the first month, the arrival of the, uh, <clears throat> the second angel paralleling the arrival of the second angel in Millerite history, right, April 19th. So, so we could end it that way. But we have this rather bizarre maybe bizarre is not quite the right word i always use that word bizarre but to me it's just something that's just so unusual um that you can take 2300 months and you can come to so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to go back <clears throat> to this date here <clears throat> and, and from april 19th if i count sixty-seven thousand. 920 oops 920 days now i'm starting here at the beginning of april 19th so when i do this you'll see i come to april 4th but that's the beginning of april 4th i want to come to the end of april 4th so to come to the end of april 4th i go here there's nissan one so you can see i can go from the first day of the first month april 19th when it ends so if i if i do that <clears throat> I count 67,920 days, and it brings me to the beginning of Nissan 1, April 5th, 2030. Now, we also did a, a study then. What we did is we took the literal um, days of, of that time period from 457 B.C., and I made a chart, so I'll share this here. And what this chart is, is simply uh, going from the first day of the first month in 457 BC. Um, and I'm going to be counting the actual literal days. So in that year, in 457 BC, the biblical calendar produces 354 days. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, this is an ordinal count, the 354th day. Um, and then you're going to have Nissan one. And so what I did is I compared this with our history. And I took uh, that 354 days and I lined them up. So that here we have uh, the first day of the first month representing a month. That is, we're going to do a day for a month. And that's a month of 29.530587 days. And so if we start on August 22nd, 2001, that first month would be the month in which 9-11 occurred. And so we, we could line this all up. And when I do that, we come to... Um, April... Uh, the, the, the next month, the end of that, the first day of the first month is going to be April 5th, 2030. 
So that means we can take the first day of the first month being 9-11, and then we're going to have the first day of the first month being uh, April 5th, 2030. So we, we can take this parallel to Millerite history with the first day of the first month, and we can also come to the first day of the first month in 2030. Now, I did it another way, too, with 30-day months. And when I did 30-day months, and I start at 9-11 itself as the first day of the first month, uh, when I continue counting through, I'll finally come to uh, not the first day of the first month, because I have 30-day months. I'm actually going to come to the Day of Atonement, which is uh, October 8th, 2030. So... I get these two different dates by counting the months, lunar months and prophetic months. So to me, this is pretty profound. So that's why I took this 2030 date, April 5th, 2030, and said, we need to look at this. And what we had done is a study dealing with um, uh, the World Economic Forum and because they have this 2030 year and, and try to see the connections there. But I'm not predicting anything on April 5th, 2030, or on the Day of Atonement in 2030, because that would be the temptation that people would have, right? If I started predicting, if I started proclaiming, um, you know, something's gonna happen on April 5th, um, maybe, and maybe Christ is coming back on October 8th, 2030. What would I be doing? Time setting. I'd be time setting, but more right. than what's that? No, I just say so you just go right back where you not supposed to be going. Yeah, I would have to call that fanaticism, right? Right, because yeah, like definitely. Yeah, and 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 there would be a temptation that some people would have to do that, right? So I was a little reluctant to share these future dates two reasons. So one is it could be conceived as a peace and safety message. Nothing's happening now uh, because, you know, all these things are going to be happening in the future. So you got lots of time. You got like eight years or whatever, right? That could be the way that it could be perceived. But also it really was the point that we don't time set. We have quite clear counsel. We've learned things from what we have done with July 18th, that we're in a typical line but what I recognize that it, at the very least, these dates have some symbol symbolic significance. Um, I would argue that it does show us that the Sunday law isn't coming right now, but I don't know what these dates mean, but we have time attached to our message and our message is leading up to the Sunday law. So maybe somehow the Sunday law is connected in some event in the future, I don't know. But I can't make a prediction based upon these dates in the future. You need the lights on behind your computer. Oh, well, I can. That's not that important. But. <clears throat> okay. So, <clears throat> so we have that date. Now, we also have a more immediate date, and that's the November 24th, 2022 date. Now, when I first looked at this date, um, it was based upon... Um, I'm trying to even remember why I even looked at November 24th, 2022. Oh, I think it had to do with Odilio's um, 1,629 days. So we were we were looking at this for some reason. I don't remember why. Um, but I had uh, looked at this, and I, I I tried to say, well, where could we put this 1629? Where does it fit? And I. I looked at the June 9th, 2018 date. That's when time setting comes into this movement. And I counted these numbers of days and that brought me to November 24th, 2022. And the significance, the only significance I saw there is that it's Thanksgiving. And I know that back in 2018, we had a Thanksgiving prediction um, that was meant to test whether we could set dates in the future or not and whether we could predict events. And my conclusion was, is that we couldn't based upon that, that we could look at things afterwards and try to interpret them 
and say, well, we, we predicted a date, then when the date passes, what did it mean? But we couldn't know what it meant prior. And, and even then, once we looked at the date, there was a difference of opinion about what the significance of the events that occurred, uh, how would they, they would apply. So, so I, I noticed that. And then, um, um, then there was notice that there's 1111 days from November 9th, 2019. So that 1111 is a significant symbol. And of course, November 9th, 2019, um, that we have that span of time to November 24th, that seems significant. I also looked at the number of days to July 18th, 859 days. And 859 in base eight, which is a symbol of FFA, this movement, is 1,533 days. So I thought, well, that's rather interesting. Then we also noticed um, from February, February 24th, 2022, I believe it was Stephen that noticed this about the Ukrainian war, that it's 273 days to November 24th, 2022. And then <clears throat> I just thought of looking at other things. So uh, there was also 16... 1629 weeks which went back to September 11th 1990 and that September 11th 1990 is the misplaced speech of um, of uh, Bush senior uh, that actually occurred on September 23rd 1990 where he speaks before uh, the UN and people place it on September 11th and, and the significance there, September 23rd, is the date in early writings, page 74, that's actually October 23rd. So we have a September 23rd date. So the September 23rd shows up a few times. But in this case, it was 1,629 weeks um, from that speech to the November 24th would be, be the start of the 629th week. But I also looked at 1190 days. Now, November 24th is 1124. So if we multiply 11 by 24, we get 264. And if I count back the number of days that uh, are used for the Islamic calendar to do a complete cycle in relationship to the Julian calendar, it's 11,900 11, days. So I counted back 11,900 days from November 24th, and I got April 26th. So April 26th is a symbol of Islam, the 26th day of the fourth month, in 1990. <clears throat> and then I noticed that if I counted from April 26, 1990, uh, the number of days that the the manna falls, that is from the time it first fell uh, to the time when they go out to gather it and it hasn't fallen, which is uh, an ordinal count of 14,589 or a cardinal count of 14,588 days, <clears throat> that I could go from this April 26th date and it would bring me to April 5th, 2030. Now, I also noticed from November 9th, 1989, because we have November 9th, 2019 in here, to April 26, 1990 is 168 days. 168 days is, 168 is a symbol of a week. That's the number of hours in a week. And then I noticed from November 24th, 2022 to April 5th, 2030, um, <clears throat> that it's 2,688 exclusive days, that's the number of days between those two dates. And that's <clears throat> that's uh, 16 times 168. And then uh, Iran asked me to look at how many days between April 26, 1990 and June 9th, 2018. And that's 10,271 days, which is the 120 or 1260th prime number. So 1260, 1260. At, so that number 10,271 is pretty significant in that it's the 1260th prime. And also that 2688 
uh, ha is if you do the factorization, it's two to the power of seven times three times seven. You have all of the numbers of 273 of the message to the Levites. And you can see the 273 there from February 24th, 2020 to November 24th, 2022. And so you have that 273 being represented in that 268. And then of course, 586, <clears throat> 586 is the year that uh, the temple was destroyed, Solomon's temple. Um, and it had some other significance around. What was the other significance of 586? It has to do with the triangle and a circle. Okay. And it's like the area between the triangle and circle. Yeah, so it has to do with geometry. So we've been looking at triangles and circles and squares and, and these relationships. And... Um, there was uh, something else, but I can't remember. Anyway, so we can look at all these different dates. We can see June 9th to November 9th. This was noticed before that it's uh, April, or not April, August 15th, if you read it backwards, 518. Of course, the 252 in there. So all of these different symbols that, that occur. <clears throat> so the question... So now that we've looked at this, have I tried to set dates based on what I told you here? Am I seeking to set dates to um, to predict some event in the future? I mean, why am I doing these things? Why am I looking at these dates? Is this the right thing to do? Well, you're not predicting any events. You're not putting any, any events attached to them. But, but shouldn't I just kind of ignore... You know, nor all these dates, you know, we can't predict events. So why am I looking at dates still? You're looking at waymarks. Okay, so I'm looking at waymarks. So what it specifically it I was... shows how God is leading. Uh... Yeah, and we're looking at symbols, right? So the, the whole reason I start looking at some of these spans of time is when we're sorting through the story of the judges, we find all of these symbols, right? Right. So, so we see these symbols. We know these symbols are attached with our message. We're not. We're not specifically trying to to set time, but we also know that when we started looking at these symbols in the story of Joshua and the story of Judges. Uh, we would see that things represent spans of time and that we could connect events in the past uh, to events in our time. And, and don't we need to do that? Don't we need to measure the time? Yes. Yeah. Because these are this is what's given in God's word. Now, when we look at the misuse of this, so when we look at <clears throat> uh, Gideon's ephod, what is being illustrated here that shows that this is a misuse of time? And how is it illustrating it specifically? So first thing, in 8.22... It says, then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, rule thou over us, both thou and thy son and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. Now, we're taking that Midian <clears throat> represents this uh, enemy that is, is criticism, right? It's this critical spirit, this disunity, this judging others. Midian means strife. So, so Midian is defeated in this, but 
we now going back in a sense we're doing a repeat and an enlarge and so this is the victory of july 18th and the men of israel are asking this july 18th message to rule over them so what are they asking for maybe maybe we could look at it as dwight's crutch that he's talking about that this is a crutch well the point with this is that they're not wanting to take responsibility to accept the message themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and we saw this really manifested on that one study um, that went for five hours on a Friday night, um, where the suggestion was, uh, basically, it's too complicated. You need to make this simpler. And of course, I'm not responsible for this. That is, I'm not the one who created the sun and the moon and the stars and the calendars and gave us chronology and time. God did this. The experience without doing the work. Right. So people want to have, and, and the reason why people want a king, uh, the basic part of human nature, it's why people follow cults, is we don't want to take responsibility for our own actions and our own decisions. If somebody else can make the decisions, then if things don't work out, we can blame them, right? Okay. <clears throat> but I think there's, there's a bigger issue here. We are going to face, and we're going to be facing soon, the attitude of most Protestant believers. Because they're not choosing to study. Mm -hmm. Their attitude is, everything was done for me at the cross. I don't have to worry about the law. I don't have to worry about the covenant. Jesus has done it all. So I'm saved no matter what else happens. Mm -hmm. How are we going to be able to address this when we have so many examples within scripture, whether we're dealing with Gideon, whether we're dealing with Jephthah, whether we're dealing with Ezra, whether we're dealing with Elijah? that we have to walk by faith and not by sight. Mm -hmm. Right. So as a Christian, as a true Christian, we have to take up our cross daily and follow Christ. Mm -hmm. We have to drink from the cup that he drank from and be baptized with the baptism that he was baptized with. Right. Right. That's the cross. Christians somehow believe that because Jesus took up the cross, we don't have to. Pick up your cross and follow me, she said. And even when he calls, asks us to yoke, take up, take his yoke, right? It's his yoke, not our yoke. It's his yoke. Well, it's our yoke. We yoke up with Christ. So we have, we have a helper, Christ. He's accomplished these things. But he has to accomplish them in us. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Christ is able to provide his strength for us. When we cooperate with God, <clears throat> you know, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling, for it's God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God works in us, but we still have this work to do. We have to work out our own salvation. We have to make our choices. We have to take responsibility for our actions. <clears throat> mm -hmm. We have to be connected to Christ. And when Israel asks for a king, they're taking their allegiance from God and putting it to man. And here, they're asking for a king. Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son and thy son's sons. It, he's asking for a monarchy to be set up, right? That's what the men of Israel are wanting here. Now, this doesn't happen until later that they're actually going to get a king. But that's what they're asking for. They don't want to depend upon God. They want to depend upon man. 
So now Gideon says, I'm not going to rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Is this something that the July 18th, 2020 prediction is telling us? Yeah, definitely. This is what we've learned from this message, from all of this chronology. Is One is the personal connection we have with God and our dependence upon God and the way that he leads us and guides us and shows us that he's working in our lives. We become a part of prophecy. And so we can see by faith God guiding and leading us. <clears throat> But Gideon then is going to have a request. So from this July 18, 2020 movement, from this message, <clears throat> a part of this message is now going to ask something of us, right? It's going to ask for the spoil. And from that spoil, an ephod is going to be constructed. And this ephod is going to represent a counterfeit message. Would we agree with that? Yes. Because it's not the ephod of the sanctuary in Jerusalem. This is an ephod that's going to become a snare. And so we would have to say from this July 18, 2020 message that a misuse of the chronology has to be occurring. And, and the question that I had is, am I misusing chronology now when I'm putting these dates in the future? Am I the one responsible? <clears throat> Are we responsible when we do that? Are we somehow making an ephod? That was the question that I proposed because I could see how that could be interpreted this way. <clears throat> That's an interesting application. Yeah. So we, we need to be clear. We need to know, are we doing this or are we not? <clears throat> I don't think so because the numbers are showing that God's the one leading. Okay. We have many witnesses too that the numbers exactly the span of time okay now um we have this measurement too this these shekels <clears throat> and i don't know if I, I'm trying to remember exactly how we did this. Uh, um, I can't remember, I can't find it. Um, I'm gonna, I know it was in one of my papers, uh, not my papers, but one that I downloaded. So, so we had a, a measurement here, <clears throat> um, of how much this weighed, a uh, thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold. Now, when I had looked at this before, if I remember correctly, that, that this ended up being, um, I think it was ounces or something like that. No, it wasn't ounces. It was, what's the smallest measurement that they have? Is it a grain? Right? Is that what it is? I believe that it is a grain. Okay. So it had something to do with the grain and that this was this many grains uh, the number of grains was 509,760, if I remember correctly. 
um, and that number of grains, and this was based upon a certain weight of a shekel. So I can't remember the weight that it was. Um, but that number of grains is the number of seconds in it. Wait, no, that wasn't the right number. That's why. Uh, if I take a 364 day year, so 364 is what some people call a perfect year. That is, you have 52 weeks is 364 days. And if we multiply that by 1440, the number of minutes in a day, you get 524,160. And that number of grains <clears throat> is a is the weight that's represented here. I think that's what it was. It might have been another place. Um, so I'm going to have to look that up again. I, I just didn't have time to do that. Uh, but anyway, we have these shekels of gold. And, and somehow in here, I had, had figured out this number of grains, that this is a symbol of time. So this weight of these gold earrings is a time measurement. <clears throat> And so people are using time because we have all the symbols that we use to measure time here. Um, and they're making it into a structure, an ephod. Now, my, my, my belief based upon everything that's happened is that this misuse of time is Odilio's study and Colin's study. Now, why would I say that? other than the fact that I'm biased. Because they're setting, they're predicting an event they, uh, with that. Yeah, so they're using these, these time structures to make a claim that a Sunday law is coming immediately and that Trump's going to be put back into power, right? Yep. So, so they're trying to use this time in a way that I don't believe that we can use time. But from somebody looking at the outside, they can just say, well, you're both using time. I mean, I'm putting dates in the future. Now, there is a difference, too. We have the, the wait and see attitude, which is time will tell, which, you know, some people could argue that's what I'm doing is I'm putting a date in the future. I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe something might happen, you know, just because I'm not attaching an event to it. I'm sort of got this same sort of attitude. So how do we distinguish these things? How do we, how do we clarify that we're not doing this, that we're not going in this wrong direction when we start looking at dates in the future? Anybody with thoughts on this? How, I mean, sure, we're not, we're not picking out exact. <clears throat> you know, exact. Um, well, okay. Yeah. Again, if we, if we use the example that we're traveling along a road. Okay. When you're traveling you are going to notice road signs. You are going to notice way marks to tell you how far you are coming. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, <clears throat> that is currently being presented amongst other Protestant churches is that we don't need to know any prophetic way marks because Jesus has already done all of this. So we don't need to pay attention to what's going on. Jesus is coming. He's going to take us all home. And 
we don't have to worry about anything else. And he's going to come as the thief in the night. So, you know, we're not going to know. Yeah, know, they misuse of the verse, but it's a huge misuse of the verse. Now, <clears throat> our situation <laughs> is that we are told that we need to pay attention because he is coming as a thief in the night. Yeah. We need to be aware. Now, <clears throat> how did others in biblical history come to understand that there is an importance to the law and to the prophets? They did it by studying. Mm -hmm. Now, Ahab had exactly the same materials available to him that Elijah had. But Ahab chose to listen to his wife. We have a choice here. We can either study and come to understand the way marks that are being presented. That 9-11 is important. That everything that we've seen occurring within the movement has something for us to understand. Or we can we can decide, oh, we're just going to remain blissfully ignorant. I, for one, don't want to remain ignorant. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so, so just a, a thought there, too, with um, uh, watching and waiting. What does watching and waiting mean? Like Ellen White says, we are not to know the exact time, you know, of the Lord's coming. That's not given us to know or, of, of, you know, the outpouring of the latter rain. And so, but we are to watch and wait. So what is watching and waiting? How is that different from time will tell, for instance? Well, watching would be uh, seeing recognizing the signs of the time mm -hmm. okay <clears throat> a watchman on the wall <clears throat> mm -hmm. what was the purpose of the watchman of the wall of the city when he sees uh, a sign of an enemy approaching he gives a warning <clears throat> all right are we not to be as the watchman on the wall right now yeah uh, so to me, watching and waiting is an active thing Ellen White is telling us that we are to do. Because if we set a date, and she says, you know, we can set a date so far in the future uh, that, you know, we can, you know, think that there's nothing to worry about. But we need to be watching and waiting. We need to see the signs of the times. We need to know where we are on the road. And, and that's what, for now... The symbol that's being given to this movement has been time. But we also see all the events happening, right? But how do we interpret those events and understand them correctly? We, we saw that Trump fulfilled a role as being um, uh, Xerxes, right? And then we now want him to be Alexander the Great. And, and Jeff is the one that really first suggested this. But when Jeff suggested it, uh, Trump was going to be the head of the UN, right? That was the idea. That Trump would be the president of the United States, and then the world would be in such bad shape that the world would ask him to be the head of the UN, this one world government. Um, but that didn't make sense to me, especially as I started looking into Trump and recognizing uh, what Daniel 11, verse 1 to 5, or 4, is talking about. And uh, we can see quite clearly then that Trump can't possibly be Alexander. It doesn't make sense when we look at the history, and, and we need to understand the history because the history is what's repeated in Daniel chapter 11, correct? 
we're looking at a repetition of history. Right. Our time. Yeah. So, so yeah. That we, we understand how it was fulfilled, and then we can look at that history and parallel it with our time. So Xerxes doesn't become the head of Greece. Xerxes loses to Greece. Trump lost to um, the globalists, right? He was defeated. <clears throat> and the United States, you know, even if you take the idea that um, that Colin put forward, and this is the point that I was trying to get him to understand, is that I agree that the golden image in Daniel chapter 2 uh, represents the United States and the Sunday law. And so all of those kingdoms, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, all come together in this a golden image, right? It's going to be gold all the way down. So that means then, when we look at the fulfillment of history, um, and we see Greece defeating Persia, that would mean that the United States is conquered by the globalists. Does that make sense to people? Maybe I'm not saying it too well. Well, it lines up. It all lines up to it. <clears throat> yeah. Now, so we have, um, yeah, and there's still more that, you know, that I wanted to explore way back then when, when Colin first brought this up, December 25th, 2021. Because I right away saw that he was on to something, but he was going down a wrong path as well, trying to get Trump to be reelected. And, and I can see that that's not correct. But there is still more that we need to understand from it. We, we spent some time studying it. But what we do know is that um, um, that what happened on January 6th within our line is the king of the south defeating the king of the north. The Democrats being the king of the South, the Republicans the king of the North, right? It's the Civil War. That was what was being acted out. But then we know that what follows that, the king of the north has to defeat the king of the south, correct? King of the north would, yeah. The king of the north would come next. But in this case... Be the papacy. Okay, well, the papacy. But, but we do believe that the Republicans are going to defeat the Democrats. That we're going to have this conservative yep. backlash. Yep. But... In none of that would we need to have Trump become president. Right. Right. Because we believe that the United States in the typical line came to an end when the Democrats defeated the Republicans. And the globalists took over the United States. That's the end of the United States. And the way that we understood it is that Trump was the last president. <clears throat> But we didn't understand that it was a typical line, right? We were looking for the United States to literally end, right, with Trump as president. But if we looked at the symbols that we had already set in place on how we got Trump there in the first place, we would have to recognize that it was not the big line, right, that it was something within our line. Because our line is a repeat of history. And so we need to understand the history that happened in the past to understand how to apply it in the present. And so there's been this misapplication. And anything else that somebody can note about that? Uh, 
<clears throat> because Collins, Collins, in a sense, doing the same thing. He says the Republicans are going to defeat the Democrats, and that's going to happen in this election, right? And maybe he's correct. But that still doesn't put Trump as president again. I mean, maybe the conservative backlash is going to happen now, and it's going to be big enough to lead to the Sunday law. But I think that we're looking at something that's going to take a little longer. And that there's a lot more that has to happen before we have a Sunday law, such as the warning of the Levites, the calling of the Levites, and also a message that goes to the world. <clears throat> okay, so when we look at this passage here, so we have this ephod made. They, they want uh, Gideon and his sons and his sons' sons to rule over them. Gideon won't rule over them. He's going to take this spoil, and he's going to make this ephod. It's going to be 1,700 shekels of gold, so 1,700 shekels of gold. And, and he's going to put it in the city of Oprah. So what, what is this symbolizing? What is Oprah? Okay, the word itself means a female fawn. So what is that representing? Okay, well, let's look at uh, Judges 6, 11, right? So when Gideon is called, there came an angel of the Lord and sat under the oak, which was in Oprah, that pertained unto Joah. So we have this wine press here, right? And we have false worship, correct? In the story of Gideon. So what does it mean when he takes this ephod and he puts it in the house of Oprah? So what is he doing? What is this movement doing if it takes this ephod and sets up this system of worship? <clears throat> it's doing something they know is not supposed to be doing. Uh, with us setting, um, putting Trump as okay. right. So they're going back to something that was before that was based up, yeah, because we had right. a, a false understanding, a false message, right? Right, and and this is really the Protestants. And so when he takes this ephod, aren't we matching up with the Protestants again? Well, yeah, and what we're not supposed to be doing either. Okay. Setting, uh, making predictions. Right. So, so we're taking something that we had in the past that was God has corrected. He's corrected us about time setting. But we're just going to make this ephod and we're just going to go back to where we were before. Right. Sure, we have an ephod now and we don't have, you know, uh, a pagan idol, but really it's the same thing, isn't it? 
Yeah, you're going back. You're going back to the idol. Mm -hmm. Go back to that idol. Yeah. So, so people have a choice, right? If we're going to truly defeat the Midianites, we're going to have to abandon this false understanding that we had. And accept the truth. And that, of course, is going to do a work upon us of converting us, because really defeating Midian is about uh, conquering self. <clears throat> okay, so, so far, is this helpful, what we've done here, in asking this question? It's been helpful to me so far. Okay. Well, it's been helpful to me, but these are questions we have to ask because we have to know, are we doing God's will or not? And so when I see this here, I see that Gideon has this error. The question is, are we going to, are we making that error? That's, that's a valid question to ask. And we need to be corrected by God if we are making this error. Now, they're going to have this period of 40 years in which this Gideon, um, uh, his, this judge Gideon, in which, you know, they're going to have quietness 40 years in the days of Gideon, right? And then Gideon's going to die. Um, so what does the death of Gideon mean? Okay, first off, 40 years. What's the significance of 40 years? <clears throat> Parallel with the 40 years in the wilderness. Okay, 40 years in the wilderness. Okay, now one of the things that we've noted is that uh, this 40 years is um, in the wilderness, we, we attach it to the manna, right? So if we take the manna, right, and we already talked about that, the manna falls for 40 years less a month, correct? Correct. Yeah, so now I address this, of course, in, in my personal life from the day that I was converted uh, to July 18, 2020. So I was converted in 1980. There's 40 years there. And and it's, it's going to be to the day <coughs> for my conversion on August 11th, 1980 to July 18, 2020. So it's, it's pretty amazing. It's the exact period of time that the manna fell, that is from the day that the manna fell to the day, the last first day that it fell to the last day that it fell is 14,587 days. That is, it's an inclusive count. I'm, it's an ordinal count, right? Now we know, of course, and, and I'm just going to bring this up here. So I'm going to go back to the manna. <clears throat> So we know it's in 1533 BC. I want to see that backwards. So, so 1533 BC, and the man is first going to fall on the 16th day of the second month, right? May 13th uh, on the Julian or on the Gregorian calendar, 1532 it says, but on the Julian calendar, it's May 27th. Uh, 1533. So the man is going to fall on that day for the first time. Uh, so I'm just going to put that date down at the bottom. You can see it there. And then the man is going to fall 
the last day it falls is going to be in 1493. But it's going to be after they cross the Jordan River. And it's going to fall. Um, well, they're going to go on the 16th day. So let's just do it this way. On the 16th day, which is a Sunday, they're going to go out to gather the manna on May 5th. And are they going to find manna? No. No. So this is the first day they go out to, to find the manna, and there is no manna after God had given them this manna. Now, if I, I save this and you look at the number here, you can see it's 14,588 days, right? So that's the number of days, uh, a cardinal count, from when the manna first fell to when they go out and they don't gather manna. So the manna didn't fall, didn't fall on Sunday. That Sunday it didn't fall because they had eaten the old corn of the land, right? So it says... And I just want to bring up something here that uh, is quite important. Um, I don't know if I've shared this before. So <clears throat> um, I know I've at least hinted at it. Um, but when we go to Leviticus 23, and you're going to have uh, the Feast of First Fruits, right? So the Feast of First Fruits, that's going to be uh, the day after. Um, the first day of so this is going to be the feast of first fruits when they're actually going to go out to gather this um manna and there isn't going to be manna correct it's going to be the day after the first day of the feast of unleavened bread because the passover is on the 14th which was a friday and and then on the sabbath uh they're going to eat uh um the old corn of the land right and then now they're going to go out to get the manna and is there's not going to be any manna because they don't need it anymore right so it says here the lord spake unto moses saying speak unto the children of israel and say unto them when ye be come into the land which i give you and shall reap the harvest thereof then ye shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. So <clears throat> this is going to be spoken. Uh, I apologize, Dido. Yeah. I was thinking about the Sabbath where, you know, they had, he gave them two, a double on Friday. That's yeah. what I was thinking about. I apologize. Okay. Yeah. So they have, yeah, they have a double portion on Friday. So the last day that they're going to go out and gather manna is the Friday, right? They're going to have a double portion. So, I mean, they're going to have for Sabbath. But when they go out on the Sunday on the Feast of First Fruits, after they have come into the land, uh, they're not going to find any manna, right? So God is telling this them this like 38 years before in Leviticus 23. Because remember, they had the Passover that they were delivered from Egypt. And then they kept the Passover a year later. But did they keep the Passover while they were wandering in the wilderness after that? No. No. So, and when this is given, this is saying, when you get into the land, that is, once you're no longer in the wilderness, uh, you're going to keep this feast called the Feast of First Fruits. And, and there's a problem that most people have never noticed because there's a disagreement. The Karaite Jews, um, and, and we'll go on and read this, but you'll see what I'm talking about here. So they're going to have the Feast of First Fruits. And this is going to have to do with Pentecost, but I want to go through this here. So you're going to wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Now, this is quite clearly referring to the seventh day Sabbath, not to the to the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Right. But Ellen White is quite clear that the Feast of First Fruits always falls the day after 
for the second day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So it's going to be a, the day after the first day or the second day. And that's the Feast of First Fruits. Now, what people are arguing about is they don't realize that when this Feast of First Fruits first occurs, it's going to be the day after the Sabbath. So God is quite clearly telling them that the when you enter into the land, that you're going to have a Passover. And that Passover is going to be on a Friday. Because you're going to have this Feast of First Fruits the day after the Sabbath. Right? And the day after the Sabbath, you're going to count seven weeks. Right? That's going to be the Feast of Weeks. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, which is going to be the seventh day Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So this is not, this is talking about actual weeks, beginning with the, the first day of the week being Sunday. But see, if you believe that this is God commanding them every single time that they have the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of First Fruits to count from the day after the Sabbath, you can see quite clearly that he's not talking about all the other instances. He's talking about the first instance after they cross the Jordan River, correct? Right. So the first time they cross the Jordan River and they keep the Feast of First Fruits and they keep the, the, uh, the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, that they're going to count it from the first day of the week. But he's not telling them that every time you keep the Feast of Pentecost, that you need to count from the first day of the week. You would continue to count it from the second day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He doesn't explicitly tell them that. But since they did it the first time, they would continue to do it that way. They're not going to start always on a Sunday to count Pentecost. Now, the Karaites in the ninth century, they go back to this and they say, well, we've been doing it wrong. We shouldn't be counting from the second day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because when we look at Leviticus 23, it's quite clear that we need to count from the day after the Sabbath. And so Karite Jews don't have the sixth day of the third month as Pentecost every year as the rabbinic Jews do. So the rabbinic Jews are carrying them on a tradition that goes back much farther than the Karaites. And this tradition is that we it's always the second day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But if you just looked at this verse and you didn't know that the first time that they crossed the Jordan River, that it's going to be on a Sunday that they have the wave sheaf offering, then you could misunderstand that as the Karaites did. I, I hope that's clear to people. Not everybody's aware of this controversy. So when we go to 1533 and we look at the first day that the, ma that the manna is gathered, it's going to be a Sunday, right? It's in 1533. It's the 16th day of the second month. It tells us this, right? So, so we know that that's going to be the, the first day that the manna is, and it's going to be on a Sunday. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread is going to be the first day that they go to gather the manna. Well, it's not the it's and it's the second Passover if you're going to look at it that way because this isn't in the first month. But it's going to be that Sunday. And then when they uh again cross the Jordan River and they're going to keep the first Passover, it's going to be on a Friday. And then when they go out on the Sunday on the feast of unleavened bread to gather um manna they're not going to find any so it's going to be 14,589 days cardinal uh, or ordinal count and it'd be 14,588 days cardinal count or yeah yeah cardinal count so so when we go back to this chart and I talk about 40 years 
Uh, we can see that that 40 years of the manna brings us back to April 26, 1990, if we go up to this April 5th, 2030 date. So that's going to be the count of the manna. And that's going to be 40 years. Now, we know that we have November 9th, 1989. But we also have this span of time from November 9th, 1989 to um, December 25th, 1991 which marks the time of the end. That is, we have two dates for the time of the end in our time. Not just November 9th, but also December 25th, 1991. Right? We, we understand that, correct? And we parallel that to, um, to what? What do we parallel that to? We have we have um, Ronald Reagan and we have George Bush. Anybody know what we're doing? Can you repeat the question? Okay, when George Bush is, we have Ronald Reagan and George Bush at the time of the end in 1989. Why do we do that? Because um, Ronald Reagan, I'm sorry, Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan, George Bush was there. It was a, it was a progressive fall of the um, USSR. And Ronald Reagan was the um, one who was there when, with the Pope taking down Russia, but it didn't fall until, it didn't completely fall until, um, I think it was 1991, if I ain't mistaken. It actually fell in that time period where it finally collapsed, right? Okay. Yeah, so you're going to have Reagan there in 1989, but he's he's actually not the president on November 9th, 1989, right? You're going to have Bush as the president. Right. Okay. So we put we put Reagan there. Um why? What what's the precedent? Why do we have Reagan and Bush? I know they co-governed at one point. Reagan and uh, Bush. Co-governed? What do you mean? Well, Reagan got shot. And then oh. um, Bush was yeah. taking the reins. I would, I would have to disagree with you on that one point. Because yeah. Ray, the attempted assassination on Reagan occurred in the same year as the attempted assassination on the Roman pontiff, and that was in 1981. We're talking here eight years later, 1989, because oh, yeah. I was Reagan, yeah. Okay. yeah, you were. Was, wasn't Bush, though, the vice president to, if for both Reagan's terms or not? He was the vice president for both of Reagan's terms is correct. Yeah. But the situation <clears throat> at that time was that there was a, and I'm speaking of 1981, there was a big discussion as to who was actually running the government after Reagan was shot. Okay. Very popularly presented and derided was the comment of General Alexander Haig that he was in charge. Oh. Now, <clears throat> at that by the time we come down to 1989, mm -hmm. we come to January 20th, yeah. 20th day of the first month. And that was when the inauguration was done, between passing the power from Reagan to Bush. Mm -hmm. We see the fall of the Berlin Wall and the beginning of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Right. But, but uh, Reagan is not the, the president. 
No. But we put him there at the time of the end, along with Bush. It, because it, that would be because of um, that would be because of Le Daniel eleven forty, wouldn't it? Because he was there, he was put, he was there with the Pope, um, taking down um, the USSR, right? Okay, so well, I do, well partly, but I would think the main reason it has to do with Cyrus and Darius. Okay, Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Persian. So we know that Cyrus becomes, uh, um, he's the one who defeats Babylon, right? And that's going to be October 13th, uh, five, uh, 539 BC, that he's going to, uh, that Babylon is going to be conquered. Now, Cyrus is the general, right? Yes. Darius, Darius the Mede, his uncle, is the king. So now, in a sense, Cyrus is also a king too, but he's the king of, of Persia, not of Media Persia. Now, he doesn't become the king of Babylon. He doesn't become the king of Babylon um, when he conquers Babylon. He has to wait two years until Darius the Mede dies, and then he becomes king of Babylon. He gets the title king of lands when he conquers uh, Babylon, but he's not the king of Babylon in an in, in official sense, right? Um, but his kingdom, Darius the Mede, his uncle, has agreed that once he dies, Cyrus becomes king of all of Media Persia, not just the king of Media or, or the king of Persia. And so now we really have Persia comes into play. So it's no longer really media Persia when Cyrus becomes king. It's all one kingdom. So when we look at 1989 and 1991, we have the fall of the Soviet Union. In a sense, it all happens under Bush senior. But Reagan has had a huge role to play in what happens in 1989. So we have Reagan playing the role of, of Darius the Mede and Bush playing the role of Cyrus uh, the Persian. And so we put them there and we have these dual dates. We have the fall of Babylon and then uh, when Cyrus comes to the throne. And these two dates, the punishment of the king of Babylon ends a period of 70 years from the October 609 to October 539. And Cyrus coming to the throne marks the end of 70 years from when Daniel's taken captive in 607 to Cyrus coming to the throne in the fall of 607. So, so we have these double dates and we have these two, two people in the time of the end of 89. And that ties us to, to, uh, to the time of Daniel right, to the end of Babylon. So that's why we have this, this, these two. Now, we don't always see two at the time of the end, right? But this is something that ties us to, uh, to this history of these kings, where we can start with Daniel chapter 11, uh, taking that history and applying it to the United States, right? So Cyrus is king, you're going to have three kings, and then you're going to have the fourth. And, and that's how we, we did that, that count to get Trump in there as Xerxes. So, <clears throat> um, so all I'm saying here is that these 40 years, we, we can see the falling of the manna in there, right, as a symbol from the April 26th date. But it is really, if we're going to look at this and just kind of round it off, from this 1989 to 1991, the center of that is 1990. And it's in 1990 that we can count this 40 years to 2030. So I'm saying that this 40 years represents the end of any type of measuring of time. That Gideon has to do with what we're doing here 
But after 2030, we're not going to have, we're not going to be continually looking at dates in the future. That That's my opinion, <clears throat> what these 40 years are about. It's about this message from basically 1989 to 2030. Whether people think that's reasonable or not, our time is up. So we can come back to this tomorrow. You know, Ron mentioned the number 178 and 3 and 391. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. You, you told me the equinox was 178 plus the 187. Yeah. So, so when you go from the spring equinox to the fall equinox and you do an inclusive count, it's 187 days. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, 2022 yeah. minus the 178 is 1844. Yeah. And if you minus the 187, you get 1657. And what happened in 1657 was the Flushing Remonstrance which was the people of Flushing stood up for the Quakers who were having the right of worship taken away. Okay. And their so petition was signed and officiated on December 27th, 1657. Okay, so you're taking 391 from 2022. Not 391. What are you taking? 2022. Yeah, minus. 178. Yeah, that one. And then you're going to... And gonna... then from 1844, you minus 187. Okay, so 365. Uh-huh. Okay. You're coming to 1657. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I don't... <clears throat> yeah, I don't know if I would do it that way, but I see what you're saying. And it was also commemorated in the year of 1957... 300 years later on a U.S. three-cent postage stamp. So you got the 300 symbol. And the three. Yeah. And the three-cent post. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the study this morning. We ask for your continued presence throughout this day in our study, in our thoughts, in our actions with others. We ask for your angel's care, and we ask that we can come again together to study your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.